Hello there. There are 20 different traditions available in Stellaris, but we can only choose seven of them in a single playthrough. In this video, I'm going to look at every tradition and every bonus you get from that tradition to break down which ones are good, which ones are bad, and which ones you should always avoid. Let's put them all into a tier list. I also, by popular demand, am going to be attempting to talk about the worst traditions in this tier list. That's the, the bottom tiers, and I'll be discussing ways in which we could improve them to bring them into line with the other traditions, make them more powerful, make them more reasonable choices. This is going to be a very, very long video, so make sure you're sat down, make sure you've got a drink, a nice snack, and let's dive in. I wonder if you can make it all the way through. As ever, this tier list is going to start right at the very bottom. We'll look at the absolute worst traditions that you probably don't want to ever take. Now, I do need to preface this by saying, yes, all traditions give us bonuses, but because we can only take seven traditions in total, the opportunity cost of locking in one of these next three traditions is far too high for the apparent bonuses we get. Versatility is a tradition only available to machine intelligence empires, and the benefits aren't really that great. As an open, you'll get minus 10% pop assembly cost, which is really neither here nor there. On the right hand side of the tree, you get minus 10% pop housing usage. As a machine empire, you really don't care about having excess pop housing available because you're not going to be getting any logistic pop growth. And even if you are, your logistic pop growth from biopops is reduced by 50%. So it's not really that useful. Yes, minus 5% upkeep from jobs is something, but it's really not very much in terms of bonus. Minus 33% resettlement cost, again, it's not great. You're not going to be doing that much resettling with machines that spending an entire tradition on this really makes sense. On the left-hand side, we get plus 50 trust cap with machine intelligence empires and plus one available envoy. The envoy is nice, but there are more efficient traditions if we want to get envoys on on our side. Yes, machine intelligence empires generally have fewer ways of getting more envoys, they don't have access to things like the xenophile ethic, but taking an entire tradition just for plus one envoy is not worth it. Finally, we'll get minus 10% market fee, which is kind of pleasant actually, and then plus two amenities per maintenance drone. That will decrease the number of maintenance and drones we need across our empire and increase their efficiency. Nothing here is going to directly harm your empire, but it's simply not worth it when we compare it to other options available. What would make this a really good pick is if somewhere in this tradition, maybe as a finisher, we got plus one replicated drone jobs on all of our colonies. Suddenly, versatility would be worthwhile. Adaptability is the versatility of regular biological empires. This will grant us minus 10% pop housing usage as an opener, plus 10% habitability on the right hand side, which is good, but will scale off very quickly in the mid to late game as we hit 100% habitability from other sources. We'll get minus 33% resettlement cost and plus one building slots for all planets. The plus one building slots is definitely nice, However, it's not worth an entire tradition just for that bonus. If you're a Void Dweller, maybe you might want to take this much later on as your fifth or sixth for that plus one building slot if you have nothing else available that really works for you because it could be nice to have better efficiency on all of your habitats with that extra building slot. You are somewhat limited by the maximum number of building slots you can get, but overall it's still not great. On the left hand side we get minus 10% building and district strategic resource cost and upkeep, which is pleasant but not great, minus 25% orbital bombardment damage and plus 25% defense army damage. Now, whilst reducing orbital bombardment damage is still very important, it's not as useful as it used to be because actual ground combat will completely devastate your planet, killing all of the pops and then decolonizing the darn planet. So even if you can entirely hold them off in orbit and hold them off on the planet because you have a bigger army, they could just send a few xenomorphs down and cause all of the pops on that planet to die. That would not actually allow you to save the planet and thus all the bombardment damage reduction is not as good or as useful as it used to be. 
finishing this off, we get access to the planetary prospecting decision if you're not a void dweller, or the orbital survey decision if you are a void dweller. Neither of those decisions are particularly amazing. If I was going to attempt to rebalance this and make it more palatable, I would probably get rid of that plus 10% habitability bonus and instead give you 50% minimum habitability on all planets. Your species is adaptable, why don't we let them live everywhere? Additionally, instead of plus one building slots for all planets, possibly plus 0.5 building slots from city districts and from the habitation districts on habitats. That would actually, I think, make this a relatively good pick both early and later on into the game. Last and very possibly least, we have the statecraft tradition. This is a new one that came with galactic paragons. And oh my goodness me, it's not so great. So opening, we get plus 20 edict fund and we unlock the departmental efficiency agenda. I haven't talked about the previous agendas in the last two traditions, but let me tell you, they're not that amazing. Departmental efficiency will grant you 20% counselor experience gain. And then when you complete it, 20% counselor experience gain still and plus two effective counselor skill. While that's all right, there are much better agendas that we can take that will actually impact and help us immediately by not only improving, for instance, our leader levels across the board, if we've got something that improves that maybe, or possibly improving resource output or counselor number, because we'll get more counselor skill with having more counselors on the council or something else. Departmental efficiency isn't great. I am going to attempt to stay away generally from the agendas. This isn't an agenda tier list, it's a tradition tier list. I am also working on an agenda tier list to bring to you, and this is not that video. So let's get back to the statecraft tradition. All right, then on the right hand side, we get plus 10% counselor experience gain. That's just straight up worse than other possible benefits. It only benefits our counselors, and it's only 10%. Other traditions can benefit all of our leaders with 10% or even higher numbers. And yeah, that's not so great. Then we get plus 300 leader experience per launched agenda. I think that means every time we launch an agenda, we get 300 leader experience. Again, that's not very much experience. There are better agendas that will give us more experience or just better ways of getting experience than spending all of our unity on this crappy tradition. On the left hand side, we get a 10% counselor agenda speed boost. That's all right, but there are faster ways of improving your council agenda speed, like having more councillors or leveling them all up. We'll unlock the rightful claims and oppose the fallen agenda. Oppose the fallen is actually all right, but it's not very useful until quite a bit later on in the game. And even then there's probably better things you can be doing with your agendas. Finally, we'll get plus 20% council agenda effect duration. So our agendas will last slightly longer. That's somewhat pleasant, but two years isn't very much. When we finish it off, we get plus one leader capacity, plus one effective counselor skill, and then something that's absolutely diabolical. We will be granted the Galactic Administration Technology as a permanent research option with 25% progress, if not already unlocked. So if we take Statecraft later, that bonus does nothing for us. And if we take it earlier, we get 25% off Galactic Administration. As far as the finisher effect for traditions go, that is really diabolical. Plus one leader capacity is useful and plus one effective counselor skill is nice, but there are much better options. Honestly, I don't know what I would do to rework this one to make it useful. I kind of feel we need to take the whole statecraft tradition all the way, you know, back to formula. But well, you can't do this to me. You know how much I sacrificed? We're up in the C tier now. Traditions in this tier are better than what we've previously seen, but they're still not amazing. There may be a couple of picks that are quite good and have some niche uses, maybe early on or later on, or for some specific goals. But overall, you're probably not going to take these for their raw power, especially not for your first three or four traditions. Domination has slightly different effects depending on if you're a void dweller or not. If you're not, you get minus 33% clear blocker cost. And if you are, you get a juicy minus 20% habitat upkeep. That upkeep reduction is nice, but it's better later on in the game as you have more habitats. You also get access to the civil exclusion agenda, which I think is secretly one of the better agendas we have out there. But unfortunately it is locked into the domination tradition here. 
On the right, we'll get additional unity from enforcers, as well as unlocking the enhanced surveillance edict if we're not guessed out. And if we are, we'll get minus 10% deviancy on all colonies. And then following that, we'll get plus 5% worker and slave output if we're not guessed out, along with the extended shifts edict, which is an okay edict. And if we are guessed out, 5% additional menial drone output and the drone overdrive edict, which is not so great. On the left hand side of the tree, we'll get minus 10% governor cost and upkeep and plus 0.5 monthly influence. The governor cost and upkeep reduction is honestly dog poo. The monthly influence is all right, but still not amazing. We'll get plus one available housing from all upgraded capital buildings and all housing buildings if we're not guessed out, and plus two housing from synaptic nodes if we're a hive mind, or minus 25% empire size from districts if we're a machine intelligence. Overall, none of that is particularly amazing. Finally, we'll get plus 20% counselor experience gain, which is much better than the counselor specific tradition we've already looked at once, oh my goodness me, and plus 50 edict fun. That's bundled into a single choice. Comparing that with just plus 10% counselor experience gain for an entire tradition pick previously really does show you how absolutely awful that other tradition was that I'm not even going to mention. Last, we'll get minus 10% empire size from Pops, and we'll get the ability to create hegemony federations if we pick the diplomacy tradition. There are basically two versions of the harmony tradition. Harmony for regular biological empires, and synchronicity for guest out consciousness empires. Neither of them are particularly fantastic, though they do have some nice bonuses. Both will open up by granting you minus 10% pop upkeep. If you're a regular buyer, you'll get inner stability, which is all right. And for guest outs, you'll get the revision agenda. On the right hand side, synchronicity is going to grant plus two amenities from synapse drones if you're a hive mind, or if you're a machine, you'll get reduced deviancy and some more automatic resettlement chance. For regular buyers, you get 25% governing ethics attraction and minus 10 crime. Now those additional amenity output from synapse drones used to be really, really good. However, unfortunately, nowadays evaluated drones are just straight up better. They require less upkeep, they produce less amenities both before and after completing this tradition. So it's not as good as it used to be. Increased governing ethics attraction is nice. That will overall boost your unity output if you're able to make your primary factions happy as a normie bio, but it's nothing to write home about. Last on the right, both types get plus five stability, which is equivalent to a 3% increased resource output from job or trade value. Pretty tasty. On the left hand side, as a normal empire, we're going to get increased leader lifespan unless we're a necrophage, in which case we'll get reduced leader maximum negative traits and some extra unity per converted necrophage pop. That additional leader lifespan is pleasant, but there are better and longer leader lifespan bonuses we can get elsewhere in the tradition tree. Further looking at the normie empires, we'll get reduced empire size from pops, reduced demotion time unless we're shared burdens, and if we are, minus 20% leader upkeep for shared burdens. We'll also get plus 50 edict fund. Early on, that 50 edict fund is rather nice, but only if you're picking harmony in the first couple of traditions. Later, it's really not worth it. That won't even allow you to run a single edict. As a finisher for Normie Empires, we'll get plus 25% planetary ascension effect and we'll have the ability to create Holy Covenant Federations. They are not the best Federation type out there, I'm going to be honest, even if you're stacking planetary ascension effect bonuses. Looking back over to Guest Out, if we're Hive Mind, we'll also get that plus 10 years leader lifespan and a reduction in the maximum leader negative traits if we're not Necrophage. If we are, we get more unity again from converting pops. Machine Intelligence is interestingly getting minus 50% leader accident chance. Now, this is one of the only ways of reducing your leader accident chance. Whilst leaders don't really tend to have that much of a problem with leader accidents as a machine, it could be nice if you just simply want to keep alive one of your leaders, though I really, really doubt it's going to be worth it. On the right, we'll get minus 20% leader upkeep and minus 10% empire size from pops, and then again that plus 50 edict fund. As a finisher, we get 25% planetary ascension effect, which is all right, but as far as finisher effects go, that is pretty crap. We will also not get the ability to create a Holy Covenant Federation, allegedly, if we are a guest out consciousness, which is kind of sad. 
If I was going to improve these two traditions and try to bring them up further into the balance, make them more regular picks, I'd probably do something like double that stability bonus up to 10, give the regular biological empire a finisher effect that increases their unity output and possibly increases faction happiness maybe by 10% across the empire. That would make it a better choice for bio empires. For synchronicity, maybe we should give some unity bonus output as a finisher, maybe plus 20% empire-wide monthly unity, and also improve that darnable increased amenities from synapse drones. We just maybe put something else in there, maybe increase some unity output from maintenance drones possibly. And then when it comes to edict fund for both, I'm thinking we keep that plus 50 edict fund, but we also throw in a minus 15 or minus 20% edict cost that would scale throughout the game meaning you'd still get the edict fund bonus early on but you'd also get some edict cost reductions i don't know these are just my thoughts let me know down in the comments if you've got any interesting ideas about how to make some of these traditions that are really garbage just a bit better having expansion so low down in this tier list i understand is a bit of a controversial decision for some of you out there watching this video and i know i'm going to get berated on a couple of forums and called an idiot because i've got it quite low down by some people honestly i think you're wrong i do think it deserves its place down here in the c tier now what is good about expansion well what's not great about it is the opener plus 25 percent colony development speed along with the superior colony agenda but once you've bitten that bullet, if you go down the right hand side of this tree early on, getting plus one extra pops when establishing a colony and plus 10% pop growth speed or assembly speed, depending on if you're a machine or not, that is really good. After that point, I probably wouldn't come back and finish this tradition until much later on. And I'm absolutely rolling in unity and don't have anything better to spend it on because the rest of this tradition is really pretty garbage. On the left hand side, we start getting into the garbage. So we get minus 10% starbase influence cost, pretty much neither here nor there. Minus 20% starbase upkeep, that's nice. That means we can go one over our starbase capacity without having too much in the way of ill effect. But again, that's only one over our starbase capacity. We'll also get minus 25% empire size from systems and colonies. That is okay if we're trying to stick below that magic 100 empire size so as not to make our agendas too expensive. But otherwise, later on, it's, it's really not that great. It's a minor bonus, a minor reduction to tradition cost and the cost of research. If we finish it completely, as a Void Dweller, we'll get minus 20% habitat build cost, which is really good, okay? I want to clarify, if you're a Void Dweller, this is definitely A tier stuff, because that minus 20% habitat build cost is essential for reducing your infrastructure expenditure on habitats. It means every fifth habitat is now free, and that's really good, ignoring influence cost. However, if you're not a Void Dweller, you get plus one maximum districts for all non-artificial planets. That won't be that many planets, even if you're in a massive galaxy. You know, that, that's one district. It's, it's a couple of jobs here or there. Nothing that amazing, especially when we can do things like put out orbital rings and build additional habitation modules on those rings to get up to four additional districts without having to lock in an entire tradition. Generally, there are better early choices than expansion. There are choices that are going to impact your economy more and get you to a higher footing faster, even if we're only looking at the plus one extra pops when establishing a colony and plus 10% growth speed. They are good, but they don't outweigh the rest of the crap that we have to scale through to finish off this tradition. On top of that, if we don't take expansion early on, most of the benefits will not be very good. So the longer we wait to take it, the worse this tradition also gets, which is why I'm very comfortable putting it in the C tier, if not possibly the F tier, but there are definitely advantages to getting one extra pop and 10% growth speed early. I have to hold my hands up and say that. And if you're enjoying this video, I invite you to take part in a tradition as old as time, Probably, I'm, I'm sure it's pretty old. And press that sacred like button. Rounding out the C tier, we have a tradition that is either completely useless to you or kind of essential depending on your playstyle. 
The politics tradition focuses entirely on the galactic community. So if you don't care about galactic community stuff, you're not going to want to take this. Opening it out will give you plus one envoy, as well as plus 0.1 influence per envoy assigned to the galactic community, which is rather nice. You'll also get the pioneer politics agenda unlocked. Starting off looking at the right hand side, we'll get a reduction in our resolution proposal cost and resolution veto cost of 25% in terms of influence. That can be pleasant, but maybe it's not that great. On the other hand, plus 2.5% diplomatic weight per envoy assigned to the galactic community is very, very good if we're trying to rush to become the custodian or make sure we have control of galactic politics. Again, if you don't care about galactic politics, this tradition is absolute dog poo. After that, whenever another Empire resolution passes, we'll get plus 25% diplomatic weight until a resolution proposed by our Empire passes. That can be very, very good. On the left-hand side, we'll get whenever a resolution passes with this Empire support, a single favor from the Empire who proposed it. That can be nice for pushing your legislative agenda through later on. And whenever a resolution proposed by this Empire passes, we'll gain 18 times our Unity output. That basically means we'll get a year and a half of unity straight up. If we're passing lots of laws, that can be a hefty sum of unity. Finally, we'll get minus 25% veto cooldown and minus 25% emergency measures cooldown. Those are only useful if we end up on the Galactic Council, but if you're taking this, you're probably aiming for Galactic Council dominance anyway. As a finisher, we get 10% diplomatic weight, which is nice, and we unlock the politics traditions resolutions. Some of those resolutions are relatively powerful. Honestly, even though this is in the C tier, I don't think I would do anything to actually change this tradition. It's very powerful if you're trying to take control of the Galactic Senate, and if you're not, you don't want to take it anyway, so I don't really feel it needs rebalancing. This is basically the Marmite of traditions. And I have to say, I love Marmite. Though to quickly go off into a slight tangent, Vegemite is better, shout out if you know what I'm talking about. We're up to the B tier. Now in the B tier, we have traditions that are still quite niche in use. However, the impact of that niche use is going to be far more wide ranging. It's going to have large economic impacts probably, or large technological impacts, or large military impacts, or large diplomatic impacts across the board with further bonuses to be gained in some cases. I'll generally expect in a playthrough that people will take around two to three traditions from this tier. Mercantile is the trade focused tradition and I have to say I absolutely love that this finally got included in Stellaris. It is of course not available to Gestalt Consciousness Empires, however it's still really really good. If you're trying to do a trade focus, this is S tier and an auto include. If you're not a trade focused empire, if you're not pre-designing your empire for trade, you probably don't want to take it and that's why it's here in the B tier. It can have some useful benefits but will not be as important and far reaching unless you're really niching down into that trade. Opening we get trade protection and additional trade collection range and as well as the open markets agenda which is not that great. On the right hand side we unlock two new trade policies. Consumer benefits allows us to turn some of our trade value into consumer goods and marketplace of ideas allows us to turn it into unity. Both of those can be very powerful and they might be very important parts of your strategy early on if you're doing a trade focused build. On top of that, if you are instead part of a trade league, you'll have the special trade league trade policy which is even better than either of the policies I mentioned because you get both unity and consumer goods as well as of course energy. And as a trade league, you'll instead get plus 50% Federation Naval Capacity Contribution. That's okay, but really, who cares? Following that, we'll get 10% extra trade value and minus 10% market fee. That market fee reduction, I would argue, is much better than the 10% trade value increase, but both are really medium kind of bonuses. Looking at the left-hand side, we get some great trickle-down economics. Plus one trade value per clerk. Now, because we have merchant guilds in the game, clerks can actually be insanely overpowered. I hate to actually say it myself. We do get plus one clerk per city district and trade district, plus three per residential arcology, and plus five per city segment on a ring world. This is going to buff your clerks and give you more of them. If you're trying for clerks, that's really good. 
After this, we probably get the best part of the tradition, which grants us plus one merchant jobs per commercial zone and plus one merchant jobs per commercial segment and trade district. That means we can build trade habitats full of only merchants, absolutely insane in terms of efficiency from a pop perspective. And we can also get entirely desolate planets full of commercial zones just for those merchant jobs. We can instead of having um, colonists, we can put commercial zones down and get merchants getting up to 15 base trade value as long as we're thrifty and extra amenities. That is a really, really good bonus. Merchants are very, very good. As a finisher, we get 10% trade value and we get access to the best, absolute best federation type in the game. And that is the Trade League. Even if you're not a trade-based empire, even if you're a guest out consciousness, Trade League is still really, really good for you. The diplomacy tradition is kind of a weird one. Some of the benefits from it are really good, but most are pretty irrelevant. If you take this tradition, you might just take it for the first left pick, which allows you to create federations and gives you an additional envoy. Combining those two in a single pick is frankly, in my opinion, balmy. Um, I honestly think that because we're locking federations behind this tradition, it does somewhat take away from, from the tradition. We could instead have federations as a technology like it used to be in the game and make this diplomacy tradition all about improving the benefits you get from your federation as it levels up. Because of course, federations as they get experience, get to new levels and give you more bonuses. Let's break down what it does and then I'll talk about what I think maybe it should do. So you get minus 50% diplomatic influence cost for all your pacts and you unlock the Diplomatic Grants Edict. That is a really good edict if you're trying to get additional uh, envoys. Then on the left-hand side, you can create federations and get plus one available envoys. That's the most powerful pick here. After that, you get plus 100% Federation Naval Capacity Contribution. So whatever you contribute doubles its effectiveness for the Federation Navy. Because the Federation Navy can only get up to generally a maximum of 600, but in some cases 400 naval capacity, this tends to be quite useless, especially by the mid to late game. On the right hand side, you'll get plus three unity per embassy, which can be nice if you're in a game with a lot of empires that want your embassies, plus 50 trust cap and plus 33% trust growth, only useful with AI empires. On the right hand side, plus five diplomatic acceptance and a 1% monthly chance to gain a favor if you're improving relations action. And that's for every improved relation action you're doing. The finisher grants 10% diplomatic weight and plus one available envoys, right. If I was going to change this up, I'd remove the Federation from Diplomacy tradition and I'd possibly make it so that you can only take Diplomacy once you have or are in a Federation. Possibly, I'm not entirely sure. And then I would make all of its benefits about getting into a Federation, A, or B, making your Federation more powerful. So have some benefits like double the bonuses you get from your federation would be really good. That would make this very useful. Also increase the uh, diplomatic relations with Xeno empires, making them more likely to accept coming into a federation with you, possibly giving you some sort of bonus to mitigate that minus 1000 relation penalty that AI empires sometimes have if they hate one member of your federation, because that can be really, really upsetting. Overall, I think that it, it is good as it is, but locking federations behind this tradition, I kind of think we maybe should go back to the previous system where it was locked behind a technology, though that could mean diplomacy is a tradition no one ever takes. But if that is the case, we simply need to buff it just a bit further. Unyielding tradition focuses on the defense of your empire, basically allowing you to build more and bigger star bases and make your planets slightly less pregnable. Even with 10 good men, you're not gonna get it done. Right, so let's look at the bonus here because I've moved this down, it used to be higher up. The reason for that is mainly down to the fact that orbital bombardment and invasion has been reworked and it's now much, much more difficult to resist an enemy. Even with this tradition, I don't really think it's worth it because it's almost impossible to stop an enemy force wiping you out completely. So the opener here is plus two starbase capacity, which is pleasant and plus 50% starbase upgrade speed. We also get the less penetrable border agenda, which is an all right one, but really not that great. 
On the right hand side, we get some crazy bonuses to our star base. 33% star base health and damage, and 33% defense platform damage and health. That is really, really good. Following that, we get plus two starbase capacity, minus 50% starbase upgrade cost, and plus four hostile operation difficulty for sabotage starbase. Sabotage starbase doesn't really get used very often, so that's not that useful, but increased starbase capacity and reduced starbase upgrade cost is a real saver in terms of time and alloys. If you're trying to be doing some turtling nonsense, getting these bonuses to your starbase damage and defense platform damage as well as hull points is completely invaluable and you have to pick it, but generally starbases and defense platforms aren't as worthwhile an investment as regular ships. And that's why this is here in the B tier. Moving over to the left hand side, we'll get plus 25% defense army health, plus 0.5 unity per defense army, which is actually quite a good unity income considering we now get defense armies as standard from our capitals. So that's basically increased unity from all of our capital buildings. Minus 10% general cost and upkeep is so bad I'm not even going to talk about it, we're going to move on. As mentioned previously, a reduction in orbital bombardment damage received is not as useful as it used to be. You can still have your pops stolen from that world relatively easily by nihilistic acquisition and that sort of stuff, and then it does nothing to prevent an enemy throwing down just a few high collateral damage armies and wiping out all of your pops on the planet's surface anyway. Minus 25% war exhaustion gain is relatively nice, and plus 25% hostile claim influence cost can also be slightly annoying for your enemies. So that is something that is good. Finally, plus 15% ship fire rate within Empire's borders and 33% ship build speed while in defensive war is definitely rather nice. The finisher effect is 50% defense platform cap, which is absolutely insane if you're trying to max out your defense platforms. And if you're going for some sort of crazy wacky defense platform build, this is very necessary. Minus 20% starbase upkeep is again nice. That's basically going to allow you to go with your starbase capacity by one if you want to, or just reduce all of your starbase uh, upkeep costs if you're at or under starbase capacity. Completing this lets you build a martial alliance federation, and if you are a bulwark tier three, all enemy ships will get minus 0.5 daily hull regen in owned systems that is your own systems, and that means they'll just start falling like flies and you won't even have to shoot them, it's pretty terrifying actually. I think if I was going to improve this, I might do something about reducing collateral damage inflicted by enemy forces. Collateral damage at the moment I think definitely needs, if not a rework, we need some defense against it because at the moment you really can't stop collateral damage wiping things out. Yes, it's not as bad as it was at 3.8's release, but it's still pretty darn terrifying. For some people, Discovery is an auto first or second pick. Now, I think that is generally not a reasonable choice. If you're wanting to increase your research, a better economic output will be the way to do that. If you're wanting to boost your leaders, there are better traditions for that. Um, if you're wanting to basically do anything except faster survey speed and get more anomalies, you don't really need discovery. You can do it in other ways. That's why it's down here in the B tier. That being said, it does have some nice bonuses. Let's get into what they are. So opening up, we get 20% anomaly research speed and we unlock the Map the Stars Edict. That will help by granting us the ability to get more anomalies, which is going to be rather useful. We also unlock the Chart the Unknown Agenda, if we have galactic paragons. On the right hand side, we'll get plus one research alternatives. As an early pick, that can be essential for some builds, although you won't come back and finish off the rest of Discovery until much, much, much later on. We also reduce our scientist cost and upkeep by 10%. Again, that's dog poo. I don't know why they started putting that kind of bonus in. It's such a minuscule bonus overall, given that we have so few leaders, I, I really don't understand what the thought was here. We'll get plus one leader pool size and plus 10% leader experience gain. That is definitely really good, the plus one leader pool size. That, that's definitely good. And finally, minus 20% research upkeep on the right hand side. That basically reduces our consumer goods, minerals, or energy usage depending on what type of empire we are. Looking at the left, we'll get an increase to survey speed and we will increase the chance at which our science ships disengage, keeping them alive for slightly longer and allowing us to explore slightly faster. It's all right, 
but not amazing. We'll then get a 20% bonus to research station output and research from starbase buildings, along with the research subsidies edict. Research subsidies tends to be too expensive for what it actually is, giving you 10% boost to research for an additional energy upkeep and quite a large unity cost given it is an edict. That 10% bonus is going to be quite small relative to the other bonuses we'll be getting from technologies, stability and other things we can stack later on. Finishing the whole thing grants us 10% research speed as well as the ability to form a research cooperative federation, which is a relatively good federation if you're a machine empire, and even if you're a regular empire there are good bonuses from the research cooperative. If you're a Scalarium at tier 3, you'll also get an additional 1000 research points of every type in your research caches. That is really good, but generally you shouldn't be a Scalarium if you are, I, I'm sorry. If I was going to make any changes to Discovery, I think I would push it further into the leader side of things, allowing you to possibly get plus one leader trait picks, not just plus one leader pool size and that sort of stuff, maybe only for scientists. So scientists only get plus one leader pool size and plus one leader trait picks, but kind of double down on your scientists being better. Give them better chances to roll certain uh, traits that benefit your research and that sort of thing. Of course, by that I'm meaning give them better chances to roll expertise or maybe guarantee they have an expertise like one of the civics we can get, technocracy. Also, I'd probably want to increase that 10% research speed buff and make it 20% just to make this, this tradition extra juicy and really push the boat out. It's quite easy to get a 10% research speed bonus just from a couple of leaders on our council. So having it from a tradition really makes it feel very underwhelming. Subterfuge is one of the weaker traditions here in the C tier, though it does have some bonuses you can't really get anywhere else, and that's why it's not lower. Specifically, it has some combat bonuses that are really rather useful, and that kind of means you might take it third, fourth, or fifth, if only for those combat improvements. What does it do? Well, generally it's focused on espionage and improving your espionage. Because espionage and lots of the different missions you have with espionage are useless and you won't use them, it does rather reduce the effectiveness of subterfuge. Overall, without the military bonuses, it would be much, much lower on this tier list. It would be C, if not F. Opening up, we'll get plus one code breaking along with getting increased chance of getting cloaking and detection technologies with a five-fold increase. Cloaking is something of a gimmick, though you can occasionally use it to devastating effect, and if you do, it's pretty hilarious. So if you want cloaking, grab subterfuge. You'll also get the uncover secrets agenda with this tradition. On the right-hand side, we get the code breaking and operational skill increases, as well as plus 10 tracking flat in all of our ships. That means it's really, really easy for your larger ships to kill things like corvettes and destroyers because you will neutralize their bonus evasion, or their large evasion I should say, with that extra tracking. Jumping over to the left hand side we get the other military bonus which is plus 5 chance to evade. Again, that is a flat increase which will be increased yet further with additional bonuses you have out there that are increased as a percentage. You'll also get plus one encryption, which is okay, but again, if you're not doing espionage, you don't really care. Everything else after that is pretty espionage focused. The central pick is probably the best of the next three. That grants us one available envoy, as well as 10 intel per failed hostile operation done to us, and plus 10 maximum infiltration level. That additional envoy is nice to get and can be useful. On the right we get 50% infiltration speed increase which is alright, on the left we get plus one hostile operations difficulty meaning people are less able to do useless espionage operations on us, oh no, and then we also get 20% hostile operations infiltration requirement as an increase. The finisher here grants us 50% infiltration level refund for successful operations meaning we can do more of something we're not really doing, and plus one cloaking strength. The cloaking strength is probably the nicest part of the finisher, but honestly, you probably only want the first couple of picks here on the left and right, just for those bonuses to tracking and evasion, and then maybe grabbing the additional envoy. The rest of it can probably be ignored definitely, in fact, if you're not going for cloaking. How do I think this can be reworked? Well, honestly, 
I don't really think it can be. The main thing we need here is a rework to espionage and a rework to the operations specifically. Operations need to be more impactful. Having seen Stellaris Nexus, where we're able to do operations where we completely remove a planet, cause a coup, that sort of thing, why can't we do that in Stellaris? I get that it might feel sucky sometimes to have these things happen to us. Maybe it takes, you know, 10 or 20 years to trigger this coup, but we should have some large and impactful events that can happen from espionage operations because at the moment they really do feel too toothless. And speaking of secret espionage operations, we're now over, we're over 40 minutes of the way through this gargantuan video. And welcome, if you're still with me, to the secret call out. Let me know down in the comments below if you're still here. I'd love to hear from you. If you've fallen asleep, I completely understand. But let's continue into the A tier. In this tier, the A tier, everything here and, and above here is something you're going to take in every single one of your run throughs. I can't see why you wouldn't. There is a difference in power level between the two, and that's why I have separated them out, but otherwise they're basically auto-includes. A couple of things here you won't take because there are better options that lock you out of taking them. We're talking about Ascension Traditions, of course, but don't worry about that. Let's dive into A tier. Aptitude is a new tradition that we've had with Galactic Paragons. It basically makes all of your leaders better, and if you play it right, if you play it early and correctly, it can give you some crazy advantages because of the way that resource traits are currently balanced in the game. I imagine resource traits are going to get nerfed a bit or rebalanced a bit. And also, if you're not playing directly for that strategy, it isn't quite as powerful. However, it will be buffing all of your leaders, giving you better bonuses from your leaders empire-wide. And that's why it's comfortably here in the A tier. Starting off, we get plus one leader starting traits straight out of the gate. That just means all of your leaders get an extra trait. That is amazing and pretty insane, actually, just getting one trait free. That could be extra minerals. That could be 10% extra leader experience across your empire. It could be an additional 6% science across your empire. That's the equivalent from just one leader getting one trait of almost an entire ascension perk. It's completely balmy. We also unlock the leadership conditioning agenda. Oh my goodness me, and let me tell you, that agenda is really good. Oh my lord. Anyway, looking at the right hand side, we get 25% leader experience gain, which is a nice bonus. And then, something which is kind of weird, we get plus two naval capacity per admiral and general. That's a flat plus two, not a percentage, bit of an odd one. Minus two empire size per governor level. Again, a bit of an odd one. We can no longer go below, um, I think it's 50 empire size with reductions, which is somewhat upsetting. We used to be able to go below zero and do some crazy shenanigans, but alas, that's not possible anymore. However, it can still be nice to dip down underneath 100 empire size early on if we take this as our first or second tradition in order to rush a couple of agendas. Because under 100 empire size, agendas are so much cheaper. 99 empire size compared to 101, your agendas are like 10 times cheaper to, to, to rush to finish early. So, so that's crazy. Finally, your leaders will get plus 0.5% leader experience gain per scientist level per scientist in the empire. That's a nice leader experience gain bonus. Jumping over to the left, we get what is arguably the better side of this tradition, minus 25% leader cost, so they're cheaper to recruit, and plus one leader pool size, meaning we get more leader choices. Then we'll get plus 20 years leader lifespan, unless we're a machine intelligence, in which case we get minus 25% leader upkeep, reducing the cost of our leaders yet further. That leader lifespan will be good keeping our leaders alive for even longer, hopefully until we can either ascend genetically, possibly ascend uh, cybernetically or synthetically, and keep our leaders alive indefinitely. We'll also get minus one leader maximum negative traits and minus 25% leader upkeep on the far left. Finishing off everything grants us plus one leader capacity, which is useful, and then a whopping plus one additional leader trait options, which is really, really good. Overall, I don't think aptitude needs to be rebalanced. I think it is very powerful as it is. If you're not going heavy on a leader strategy, you might not take this until second or third, but I think you'll still be taking it as a tradition because leaders are such an integral part of the game as of the release of Galactic Paragons. 
now we have one of the ascension traditions. Ascension traditions are very, very strong. They all require you to take an ascension perk first, which has some prerequisites itself, and that means they are somewhat gated until at least your uh, second or third tradition, if not later, in the case of something like synthetic. So if you're a regular biological empire, synthetic evolution is the gatekeeping ascension perk preventing you from taking this. That also requires you to have the synthetic technology, which means generally this is the last ascension path that becomes available to you. On the other hand, if you're a machine, you only need the synthetic age ascension perk, which is ridiculously easy to get in comparison, meaning you can complete this much earlier. If you're a machine intelligence empire, this is almost certainly S tier, especially if you don't have access to the cybernetic ascension path, and thus this is the only one you can take. Zooming through the bonuses here, we're basically going to be getting extra leader experience gain, extra level cap, we'll be getting the synthetic trait on all of our pops. As a machine intelligence, we'll be able to assimilate robotic pops, turning them into our robot type, basically giving them better um, traits. On the left, we'll get reduced pop amenities from robots, increased robot output. On top of the additional robot output we're already getting from the synthetic technology, that is 20% extra output across the board. We will of course be able to synthetically ascend, meaning we can turn all of our organic pops into pure machines. The flesh is weak, don't forget. We'll get plus 10% pop assembly speed if we're fanatic purifiers, and plus one machine species traits pick if we're a machine intelligence. Modifying our species will be reduced by 50% in cost, and we'll get two additional robot modification points, meaning our robots, our synthetics, will be better. Finishing this off basically grants us more pop assembly, because we'll get an additional roboticist job from our capital, and an additional trait pick, and if we're a machine intelligence, we'll just get one extra replicator from our capital, and the synthetic traits on all of our leaders. Synthetic is a great trait to have, especially on your admirals. It grants you a whopping 10% additional armor hardening to the fleet you're in, as well as improving the fleet's output. Of course, like any of the Ascension uh, traits, on all of your scientists, you'll also just get some free research. Basically, all of your leaders will simply become better empire-wide. Genetic Ascension requires the Engineered Evolution Ascension perk. This basically lets you mess around with the biology of not just all of your species, but any species unlucky enough to find themselves in your empire. You'll get access to the Clone Vat building, which has quite a high food upkeep, but will produce you three monthly organic pop assembly. And you'll get two additional genetic modification points. Going down the right hand side, that three pop assembly becomes 4.5 in total, with I believe some additional cost. I actually think that should go slightly higher, or maybe we should get some actual jobs, some clone jobs, just like we have the machine jobs that require food upkeep but grant us assembly, and that clone job could be improved by getting more of it, like we can with machine assembly. We'll also get minus 50% modified species special project cost, which means we can modify our species more cheaply in terms of our society research usage. On the left hand side, basically we're going to get loads of genetic stuff. We'll get special traits, we can remove negative traits, add positive traits, remove positive traits, do pretty much anything you want. In the end you can turn your species inside out, back to front, turn them around, change what they look like, pretty much anything. The reason this isn't higher is that the bio traits you can get are not as good as some of the other traits and other trait combinations you can have from, for example, cybernetic, or some of the base raw outputs you can get from things like psionic. Yes, they are still useful. Yes, it is still a very good tradition. It is, of course, an ascension path, but it's just not the most powerful. All right, we're now all the way at the top in the S tier. Thank you very much if you stuck around with me. This has been a phenomenally long tier list, I have to say. And if you skipped ahead just because you want to see the end, well, I understand it is a very long video. Okay, let's dive in and find out what I think is the absolute best when it comes to traditions in Stellaris. Somewhat unsurprisingly, right at the top here we have Prosperity. Prosperity is the economic tradition. If you take this one early enough, the multiplicative effects of those minor increases later and later into the game will be overwhelming compared to your opponent who may not have this. You'll start off with plus 20% mining station output, which is nice, very useful, especially if Prosperity is your first pick to boost your basic resource output. You'll also unlock the Favored Society agenda, which is 
oh my goodness me, it's a good agenda. Then on the right hand side, I expect you'll take the building reduction first. That grants minus 10% building and district cost and 25% planet build speed. That means you can build your colonies up cheaper and faster than anyone else. That's a really good first pick. Next up, we increase our housing, or if you're a Void Dweller, you get plus one building slot on your orbital habitat. This is fine, but not amazing. It's probably the last thing you'll pick in this tradition, just to finish it off. Going to the left-hand side, we get 10% building and district upkeep reduction, which is all right, not amazing. We then get 5% specialist and complex drone output, which is really good. That is 5% additional research, unity, alloys, consumer goods, anything in that zone in that specialist or complex drone area will get a nice tidy five percent bonus and it's quite hard to stack up those bonuses for specialists and complex drones so getting your hands on one is definitely good we'll also get minus five percent upkeep from jobs which is somewhat of a nice bonus but again not amazing last but by no means least we get a flat five percent resources output from jobs that is equivalent to getting something like eight and a half stability on every single planet. Taking prosperity early is definitely recommended. Finish it when you have the time, unless your strategy requires you to dip into something else. But do not forget to take it and do not ignore it. It is one of the best traditions you can have from an economic perspective. And Stellaris is at its heart a game all about economics and making your numbers go up. Next, we have Supremacy. Stellaris requires a lot of warfare. You either need to be ready to fight or you need to be actually fighting. And Supremacy ticks all of those boxes. Opening up, you'll get plus 20 naval capacity and plus 20% army damage. That 20 nav cap is very nice, though does fall off a bit later on in the game. You'll also unlock the military build-up agenda, which is another amazing agenda. On the left hand side, you should probably first off take the minus 10% ship build cost and plus 25% ship build speed. We can stack that with other modifiers to get a comfortable 50 to 60% ship build cost reduction by the mid game and push that up to 90% by the late game if we're going really wild. We also can get minus 10% ship upkeep and another 20% naval capacity. This is a percentage increase, not a flat increase, so that is a helpful bonus to have throughout the game. Ship upkeep reductions as well are very, very good. You might have the economy to produce lots of ships, you might have lots of discounts to build lots of ships, but if you cannot support those ships, they're basically useless. Reducing ship upkeep is essential to getting larger fleets out. Finally, in this area, we have plus 20 fleet command limit and a diabolical minus 10% admiral cost and upkeep. Jumping over to the right hand side, we'll get plus 10% ship fire rate, basically making all of your ships fight slightly faster, meaning they deal slightly more damage over the same amount of time compared to when you didn't have this. You also get 20% orbital bombardment damage. Finally, on the right, you get 20% damage against star bases, making them slightly easier to crack and somewhat negating the bonuses that other people might be getting from unyielding. The last thing you get in this tradition is the supremacist diplomatic stance, which is one of the best, both from a military and diplomatic perspective, getting a 100% bonus to military power or military diplomatic weight, I should say, should not be ignored. We also get the War Doctrine policies unlocked. At the moment, pretty much the best doctrine is hit and run. And then following that, you might want some sublight speed reduction, maybe the 10% bonus to your fire rate if you're in a defensive war. And you have the economics and ability to build lots of new ships, then sure, throw all your ships away with no retreat. However, no retreat is really not as powerful as it used to be. Hit and run over longer term, over lots of engagements, will let you win the day. The cybernetic tradition is the bastard child of the genetic and synthetic traditions, if I have to think about it too much. Basically, this is only unlocked if you take the Flesh is Weak or Organo Machine Interfacing. It is pretty much best for hive mind empires and also for trade based empires. Even if you're not trade based, the bonuses you'll get from the leader traits and that sort of stuff are still really, really good as well as all of the bonuses that come with this. Let's dive into the details and find out what those bonuses are. So you can unlock the cybernetic advantage agenda, which is an okay agenda, but not amazing. You unlock a special project to give all of your pops the cybernetic trait if you're not driven assimilator, meaning you already had it. 
That is a very, very good trait. It grants you extra habitability, massively increases your leader lifespan, and gives you a bit more army damage. Then, as our first pick inside the tree, we can unlock the cybernetic assimilation option, meaning any empire's pops who we take over, be that through migration or be that through conquest, we can upgrade them into cybernetic pops. That also means we can take hive-minded pops and add them to our empire. And if we're a hive mind, we can do the opposite, adding single-minded pops to our hive mind. This can be done quite early on and is very, very powerful. Going down the right side, we'll get access to the cybernetic traits or the cyborg traits. Within those, we have things like trading algorithms, allowing us to get the best possible trading pops in the entire galaxy if we combine the thrifty trait with the trading algorithm trait. We also get plus one organic species trait picks, meaning our organic species can have an additional cyborg trait. After that, we get a reduction to our modified species special project cost and we'll get some robot modification points that apply to biological pops if we're not a hive mind, or plus two augmentation drone jobs from spawning pools if we are a hive mind. Meaning this allows the maximum pop assembly for both hive minds and non-hive mind empires while still allowing for good biological pop assembly. Looking at the left hand side, we get minus 10% cybernetic pop upkeep, which will really help to pay for those additional energy costs we get from the cyborg traits. And if we're a hive mind, we get minus 10% empire size from cybernetic pops, which is all right, but nothing amazing. Then we will unlock the assembly standards policy if we're not driven assimilator, allowing us to assemble robotic pops. Or not just robotic pops, I should say, assemble cyborg pops with our robot assembly jobs. Meaning we can build our very good specialist cyborg pops without needing to clone them or grow them, we just build them straight up. As a finisher, we get 10% resources from cybernetic pops. You'll notice that is just as good as the plus 10% resources from synthetics you get with synthetic ascension. When we combine that with the fact we can stack organic and cyborg traits on our pops, means we can get overall better pops than synthetics. We also get another plus one organic species trait picks. Cybernetic really is one of the best ascensions these days. Last, but by absolutely no means least, we have the psionic tradition. Of course, you'll have to take the mind over matter ascension perk, which does require you to roll psionic theory or have had the teachers of the shroud. You don't need the ascension perk, then you just need the psionic theory, but that is guaranteed as one of your research options. But because it's so RNG based or it can be so RNG based, it means that you might not actually be able to pick this up in a timely manner. If you don't, I'd probably recommend you bite the bullet and go for another ascension path, choose a different ascension tradition. However, if you are lucky, if the gods smile on you from beyond the shroud, buckle up and prepare for greatness. You'll unlock the psionic supremacy agenda, which is good, not that great, but good. You'll also get the latent psionic trait on all of your pops, meaning some of your leaders will start becoming psionic. Psionic is quite a good leader bonus. For admirals, you get plus 10% shield hardening, which can be very good at stopping bypass weaponry. On the left side, you'll unlock the Psycore building. Now, in order to get the Psycore building, you'll need an upgraded capital building, but by the mid game, that shouldn't be too difficult to get. The Psycore building will give you some telepaths, and each telepath increases your resources from jobs by 5% for every psionic pop on the planet. That's 10% additional resources from jobs on your planet, along with quite a large unity production from those telepaths and some bonuses to reducing your crime. It's very nice. On the right hand side, we'll get an additional 10 base intel level on every other empire and the sight beyond sight edict. If you've got Zro, it's a good one to get your ships flying around just that little bit faster and giving you a tactical edge. In the center here, we will finally become properly psionic, moving from latent psionic to full psionic, meaning we get all of our leaders with the psionic trait. It's a great leader trait, you definitely want it. We will also unlock the psionic assimilation, meaning we can take other species, even cybernetic species, and convert them into psionic pops, meaning they'll get more bonuses in our empire. On the far right at the bottom, we'll get two code breaking and two encryption, meaning other empires basically can't do espionage on us, even if they're pushing hard into the espionage tradition. 
And then on the left, we'll be able to breach into the Shroud and get an additional 5% resources from jobs from Psionic Pops for each Telepath job. That means we'll get 20% additional resources from jobs on every planet with two Telepaths and as I'll talk about in a moment, there is the option to get even more telepaths, meaning we can push this up to about 50% on one of our planets, which is absolutely insane. As a finisher, we'll get 10% edict upkeep reduction and 20% shroud delve cooldown. And we will get the ability to confirm an established covenant. This means that we'll be able to not only get a covenant, as we'll get that earlier on, but we'll be able to confirm the darn thing and it will make us very, very powerful. That will unlock special technologies, special bonuses, special buildings. There is always a price to pay, but in this case, for the Chaos Gods, or should I say the Gods of the Shroud, it is definitely worth it. Corpse Emperor be damned. If you've enjoyed this tier list breaking down traditions and you'd like to see another tier list where I break down another aspect of the game, look no further than my 3.8 weapons tier list. If you'd like to know which weapons I think are the best and which weapons are absolutely terrible and you should not use on your ships, then click the video on screen now.